by R.V.C. Bodley, descendant of Sir Thomas Bodley, founder of the Bodleian Library, Oxford author of Wind in the Sahara, The Messenger, and 14 other volumes. In 1918, I turned my back on the world I had known and went to Northwest Africa and lived with the Arabs in the Sahara, the Garden of Allah. I lived there seven years. I learned to speak the language of the nomads. I wore their clothes, I ate their food, and adopted their mode of life, which has changed very little during the last twenty centuries. I became an owner of sheep and slept on the ground in the Arabs' tents. I also made a detailed study of their religion. In fact, I later wrote a book about Muhammad, entitled The Messenger. Those seven years which I spent with these wandering shepherds were the most peaceful and contented years of my life. I had already had a rich and varied experience, I was born of English parents in Paris, and lived in France for nine years. Later I was educated at Eton and at the Royal Military College at Sandhurst. Then I spent six years as a British Army officer in India where I played polo and hunted and explored in the Himalayas as well as doing some soldiering. I fought through the First World War and, at its close, I was sent to the Paris Conference as an assistant military attaché. I was shocked and disappointed at what I saw there. During the four years of slaughter on the Western Front, I had believed we were fighting to save civilization. But at the Paris Peace Conference, I saw selfish politicians laying the groundwork for the Second World War each country grabbing all it could for itself, creating national antagonisms, and reviving the intrigues of secret diplomacy. I was sick of war, sick of the army, sick of society. For the first time in my career, I spent sleepless nights, worrying about what I should do with my life. Lloyd George urged me to go in for politics. I was considering taking his advice when a strange thing happened, a strange thing that shaped and determined my life for the next seven years. It all came from a conversation that lasted less than 200 seconds a conversation with Ted Lawrence, Lawrence of Arabia, the most colorful and romantic figure produced by the First World War. He had lived in the desert with the Arabs and he advised me to do the same thing. At first, it sounded fantastic. However, I was determined to leave the army, and I had to do something. Civilian employers did not want to hire men like me ex-officers of the regular army especially when the labor market was jammed with millions of unemployed. So I did as Lawrence suggested, I went to live with the Arabs. I am glad I did so. They taught me how to conquer worry. Like all faithful Muslims, they are fatalists. They believe that every word Muhammad wrote in the Quran is the divine revelation of Allah. So when the Quran says, God created you and all your actions, they accept it literally. That is why they take life so calmly and never hurry or get into unnecessary tempers when things go wrong. They know that what is ordained is ordained, and no one but God can alter anything. However, that doesn't mean that in the face of disaster, they sit down and do nothing. To illustrate, let me tell you of a fierce, burning windstorm of the Sirocco which I experienced when I was living in the Sahara. It howled and screamed for three days and nights. It was so strong, so fierce, that it blew sand from the Sahara hundreds of miles across the Mediterranean and sprinkled it over the Rhone Valley in France. The wind was so hot I felt as if the hair was being scorched off my head. My throat was parched. My eyes burned. My teeth were full of grit. I felt as if I were standing in front of a furnace in a glass factory. I was driven as near crazy as a man can be and retain his sanity. But the Arabs didn't complain. They shrugged their shoulders and said, Mektaub. It is written. But immediately after the storm was over, they sprang into action, they slaughtered all the lambs because they knew they would die anyway and by slaughtering them at once, they hoped to save the mother sheep. After the lambs were slaughtered, the flocks were driven southward to water. This was all done calmly, without worry or complaining or mourning over their losses. The tribal chief said, it is not too bad. We might have lost everything. But praise God, we have 40% of our sheep left to make a new start. I remember another occasion, when we were motoring across the desert and a tire blew out. The chauffeur had forgotten to mend the spare tire. So there we were with only three tires. 
I fussed and fumed and got excited and asked the Arabs what we were going to do. They reminded me that getting excited wouldn't help, that it only made one hotter. The blown out tire, they said, was the will of Allah and nothing could be done about it. So we started on, crawling along on the rim of a wheel. Presently the car spluttered and stopped. We were out of petrol when the chief merely remarked, Mechtaub. And, there again, instead of shouting at the driver because he had not taken on enough petrol, everyone remained calm and we walked to our destination, singing as we went. The seven years I spent with the Arabs convinced me that the neurotics, the insane, the drunks of America and Europe are the product of the hurried and harassed lives we live in our so-called civilization. As long as I lived in the Sahara, I had no worries. I found there, in the Garden of Allah, the serene contentment and physical well-being that so many of us are seeking with tenseness and despair. Many people scoff at fatalism. Maybe they are right. Who knows? But all of us must be able to see how our fates are often determined for us. For example, if I had not spoken to Lawrence of Arabia at three minutes past noon on a hot August day in 1919, all the years that have elapsed since then would have been completely different. Looking back over my life, I can see how it has been shaped and molded time and again by events far beyond my control. The Arabs call it Mektaub, Kismet the will of Allah. Call it anything you wish. It does strange things to you. I only know that today 17 years after leaving the Sahara I still maintain that happy resignation to the inevitable which I learned from the Arabs. That philosophy has done more to settle my nerves than a thousand sedatives could have achieved. You and I are not Mohammedans, we don't want to be fatalists. But when the fierce, burning winds blow over our lives and we cannot prevent them let us, too, accept the inevitable. And then get busy and pick up the pieces. Five methods I use to banish worry by. Professor William Lyon Phelps. I had the privilege of spending an afternoon with Billy Phelps, of Yale, shortly before his death. Here are the five methods he used to banish worry based on the notes I took during that interview. Dale Carnegie. 1. When I was 24 years old, my eyes suddenly gave out. After reading three or four minutes, my eyes felt as if they were full of needles, and even when I was not reading, they were so sensitive that I could not face a window. I consulted the best occultists in New Haven and New York. Nothing seemed to help me. After four o'clock in the afternoon, I simply sat in a chair in the darkest corner of the room, waiting for bedtime. I was terrified. I feared that I would have to give up my career as a teacher and go out west and get a job as a lumberjack. Then a strange thing happened which shows the miraculous effects of the mind over physical ailments. When my eyes were at their worst that unhappy winter, I accepted an invitation to address a group of undergraduates. The hall was illuminated by huge rings of gas jets suspended from the ceiling. The lights pained my eyes so intensely that, while sitting on the platform, I was compelled to look at the floor. Yet during my 30-minute speech, I felt absolutely no pain, and I could look directly at these lights without any blinking whatever. Then when the assembly was over, my eyes pained me again. I thought then that if I could keep my mind strongly concentrated on something, not for 30 minutes, but for a week, I might be cured. For clearly it was a case of mental excitement triumphing over a bodily illness. I had a similar experience later while crossing the ocean. I had an attack of lumbago so severe that I could not walk. I suffered extreme pain when I tried to stand up straight. While in that condition, I was invited to give a lecture on shipboard. As soon as I began to speak, every trace of pain and stiffness left my body, I stood up straight, moved about with perfect flexibility, and spoke for an hour. When the lecture was over, I walked away to my stateroom with ease. For a moment, I thought I was cured. But the cure was only temporary. The lumbago resumed its attack. These experiences demonstrated to me the vital importance of one's mental attitude. They taught me the importance of enjoying life while you may. So I live every day now as if it were the first day I had ever seen and the last I were going to see. I am excited about the daily adventure of living, 
and nobody in a state of excitement will be unduly troubled with worries. I love my daily work as a teacher. I wrote a book entitled The Excitement of Teaching. Teaching has always been more than an art or an occupation to me. It is a passion. I love to teach as a painter loves to paint or a singer loves to sing. Before I get out of bed in the morning, I think with ardent delight of my first group of students. I have always felt that one of the chief reasons for success in life is enthusiasm. 2. I have found that I can crowd worry out of mind by reading an absorbing book. When I was 59, I had a prolonged nervous breakdown. During that period I began reading David Alec Wilson's Monumental Life of Carlyle. It had a good deal to do with my convalescence because I became so absorbed in reading it that I forgot my despondency. 3. At another time when I was terribly depressed, I forced myself to become physically active almost every hour of the day. I played five or six sets of violent games of tennis every morning, then took a bath, had lunch, and played 18 holes of golf every afternoon. On Friday night I danced until 1 o'clock in the morning. I am a great believer in working up a tremendous sweat. I found that depression and worry oozed out of my system with the sweat. 4. I learned long ago to avoid the folly of hurry, rush, and working under tension. I have always tried to apply the philosophy of Wilbur Cross. When he was governor of Connecticut, he said to me, sometimes when I have too many things to do all at once, I sit down and relax and smoke my pipe for an hour and do nothing. 5. I have also learned that patience and time have a way of resolving our troubles. When I am worried about something, I try to see my troubles in their proper perspective. I say to myself, two months from now I shall not be worrying about this bad break, so why worry about it now? Why not assume now the same attitude that I will have two months from now? To sum up, here are the five ways in which Professor Phelps banished worry. 1. Live with gusto and enthusiasm. I live every day as if it were the first day I had ever seen and the last I were going to see. 2. Read an interesting book. When I had a prolonged nervous breakdown, I began reading, The Life of Carlyle, and became so absorbed in reading it that I forgot my despondency. 3. Play games. When I was terribly depressed, I forced myself to become physically active almost every hour of the day. 4. Relax while you work. I long ago learned to avoid the folly of hurry, rush, and working under tension. 5. I try to see my troubles in their proper perspective. I say to myself, two months from now I shall not be worrying about this bad break, so why worry about it now? Why not assume now the same attitude that I will have two months from now? I stood yesterday. I can stand today by. Dorothy Dix. I have been through the depths of poverty and sickness. When people ask me what has kept me going through the troubles that come to all of us, I always reply, I stood yesterday. I can stand today. And I will not permit myself to think about what might happen tomorrow. I have known want and struggle and anxiety and despair. I have always had to work beyond the limit of my strength. As I look back upon my life, I see it as a battlefield strewn with the wrecks of dead dreams and broken hopes and shattered illusions a battle in which I always fought with the odds tremendously against me, and which has left me scarred and bruised and maimed and old before my time. Yet I have no pity for myself, no tears to shed over the past and gone sorrows, no envy for the women who have been spared all I have gone through. For I have lived. They only existed. I have drank the cup of life down to its very dregs. They have only sipped the bubbles on top of it. I know things they will never know. I see things to which they are blind. It is only the women whose eyes have been washed clear with tears who get the broad vision that makes them little sisters to all the world. I have learned in the great university of hard knocks of philosophy that no woman who has had an easy life ever acquires. I have learned to live each day as it comes and not to borrow trouble by dreading the morrow. It is the dark menace of the future that makes cowards of us. I put that dread from me because experience has taught me that when the time comes that I so fear, the strength and wisdom to meet it will be given me. Little annoyances no longer have the power to affect me. After you have seen your whole edifice of happiness topple and crash in ruins about you, it never matters to you again that a servant forgets to put the doilies under the finger bowls, or the cook spills the soup. 
I have learned not to expect too much of people, and so I can still get happiness out of the friend who isn't quite true to me or the acquaintance who gossips. Above all, I have acquired a sense of humor, because there were so many things over which I had either to cry or laugh. And when a woman can joke over her troubles instead of having hysterics, nothing can ever hurt her much again. I do not regret the hardships I have known, because through them I have touched life at every point I have lived. And it was worth the price I had to pay. Dorothy Dix conquered worry by living in daytight compartments.